Hey, everybody. She's Morticia. He's Gomez. I'm Uncle Fester. No, wait. This is not the Adams Family. It's the bi-week edition, a fast-approaching Halloween edition of Vikings Report with Drew and Ted. Drew, sir, how are you? <laughs> I wanted to be Lurch, man. <laughs> He's Lurch! <laughs> <laughs> The great Ted Cassidy. Rest in peace. Episode 38, Ted? There's only two episodes away from 40. <laughs> you better you better lay off that MIT math you're, you're throwing down on me, or we're gonna this this show's gonna go off the rails like right now. <laughs> Don't ask me to figure out that percentage. Yeah, thanks, Mr. E equals MC squared. <laughs> we are three and three, though, Ted Glover. It's, it's a lot better than I thought we were going to be. Yeah, it's a lot better than I thought we were going to be. How you doing? How's your day going? If I was any better, I, I'd be against the law, I think. That's how good I'm doing. Because they're creepy and they're ooky. They're kooky <laughs> and they're spooky. They're all together, jukey. <laughs> CJ Ham is jukey. The Adam family. <laughs> Tootsies, how are you? I'm doing pretty good, but I don't have any jokes today, so you just have oh. plain old stupid cat. Sorry. Boo. You have a, no joke? I have this running joke with my wife every fall about this time. She she does a great job with, like, flowers out in the front of her house. It's really, I mean, they're truly, it's like almost like a professional landscape everything. But at, at the end of the season, she cuts them back, like, really, really far. Just to like the roots almost. It's really bad. And, and and she'll like, when it gets about this time of year, she'll go out in the yard and she'll have her clippers in her hand. I'm like, oh, you're going to go more Tisha Adams, the plants I see? <laughs> I mean, I'm tired of breeding plants. Look, I crossed daffodils with roses. And what did I get? More petals. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's rapidly approaching in our household. So we got a great show again for you tonight. We got some Vikings news. Some pretty big news happened that we need to talk about. We've got our Drew Bunting question of the week. Yeah, we've, man. Got our, we've got our fantasy football update. We need to tell you about the ass kicking we put on Vikings Uncensored. And then we need to update our three-person season-long competition. And then since it's the bye week, there's no game preview, but we are still going to roll out our NFL Today preview scoreboard, except we are going to do a mid-season team review that's only one-third of the way through the year. So, again, more math. We'll try and keep it simple as the show goes on. Tower of bicycle B and it flies to the tower of bicycle A and backwards and forwards and so on and so forth until the two bikes collide and the poor little fly is squashed. But that's what's coming up. And then, of course, to end the show, as always, we've got trivia. Because the house is a museum. <laughs> Come to see him. Oh, Adam shit. Thielen is a scream. <laughs> the Adam family. <laughs> All right, but what time is it right now, Drew? Oh, what time is it right now? Yeah. I'm cooler than you are. So why don't you fix your little problem, Ted Glover, and light this candle. He's right. Light this candle. He's in the countdown. All right, I'm cooler than you are. Why don't you fix your little problems and light this candle? He's right. Let's light this candle. He surely is. Light the candle. Yes. Resume the countdown. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Definitely love it. We're coming off an exciting 34-28 overtime victory on the road against the Carolina Panthers. At the end of that game, and when we talked about this in our Vikings Report Rewind show right after the game on Sunday, and again, live, about five minutes at the end of every game, join me, Drew, and Christopher Gates, the fearless leader over at the Daily Norseman for Vikings Report Rewind. Anyways, at the end of that game, Patrick Peterson got hurt. He missed the last few minutes of the fourth quarter. And at the time, they said it was just cramps, which, okay, fine. It was pretty hot out. But now it comes out that it was not, in fact, cramps. It was a hamstring injury. And mm. Patrick Peterson has been placed on injured reserve. Now, when you say three weeks or three games with this new in injured reserve, it used to be eight games. Now it's a minimum of, of three games, not three weeks. So with the bye and the three games, he is going to have to be out four weeks minimum. So he has to miss at least three games by going on IR which means Patrick Peterson will not be available for the Dallas Cowboys game, the Baltimore Ravens game, or the Los Angeles Chargers game. 
Dallas are all easy wins anyway. Yeah, they were kind of – it's like facing Detroit three times, I thought. <laughs> He's going to be out longer than three, four weeks, dude. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Hamstrings what? at that age are like six weeks. I think three games slash four weeks is very optimistic at this point. You know what? And that, watching that when it happened, that looked like a major hamstring deal. I mean, he was like getting yeah. carried off the field. He couldn't put any weight on it or anything. So it almost looked. I mean, when they said cramps, that kind of made sense. Since you know, that kind of what happens when you cramp up. Had it not been cramps, as we were told, I would have thought knee as gingerly as he was walking on that on that leg. Because, like you said, he couldn't put any pressure on it. I think it's more than than three games. But that's just me. So uh, now you mentioned that you think it might be long term. At his weekly Monday press conference, head coach Mike Zimmer said, I don't believe it's season ending. You know what that tells me, Drew? Season ending. It is 100% season ending. <laughs> the we, way, know Zim, we know Zim Joe better than that, Ted. Come on now. The, the way the Minnesota Vikings downplay injuries, especially when it's key players. I mean, we can go back all the way to 2016 with John Sullivan's back spasms that turned into oh. a couple of days, which turned into a week, which turned into IR. We got Daniil Hunter as late as last year. It was, oh, he, 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 it's a tweak. He slept on his neck wrong. It was out a week, and then it was like uh, a couple weeks, and then he was on IR, and they made this panic trade for Yannick and Gakwe. And, I mean, it's just one thing. Oh, then it was, oh, Irv Smith, too. Oh, well, you know, we, we think he'll be okay. We, we won't really know until we get into surgery. And then, you know, we said at the time, before, before the status of Irv Smith was even known, we predicted he was going to be out for the year. And guess what? Nostradamus, you and I were both right on that one. <laughs> Ted, how long have you been watching this team, Ted? 50 oh, years. he's out for the year. We've been known to be right from time to time, Ted. So I, I don't believe a word Mike Zimmer says when he says, I don't believe it's season ending. Yeah, if he comes back, it's going to be way towards the end of the season is how I see it. But I, I believe so, too, yeah. Where else are we going to find anybody to stand by and let running backs run right past him and do nothing? on? <laughs> That's mean. I, That's just mean. I'm sorry. I will say Pearson's had a pretty good year. He was kind of making a couple business decisions earlier in the year. But these last three or four games, he has really come on and played very well in coverage and was one of the main reasons for the Vikings' defensive turnaround. Played good last Sunday. He did. He, he did. And, and now the Vikings, with the bye this week, coming off the bye, are facing the following teams. Dallas Cowboys, who have the fifth-ranked passing offense in the NFL. Then they're at Baltimore with the 11th-ranked passing offense in the NFL. The Los Angeles Chargers, I think it's at L.A., with the third-ranked passing offense. And the fourth game is the Green Bay Packers, with only the 21st passing offense in the NFL, but their quarterback is Aaron Rodgers, who has killed the Vikings his entire career. Look at those quarterbacks with the four you just mentioned. Yeah. Dak. Yeah. Dak, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert. Herbert, and Aaron Rodgers. Which is a lot different from Goof, Goff. <laughs> it is. Goff and Baker Mayfield had a crappy game, and then that Darnold mess yeah. last Sunday. I mean, part of the reason the Vikings have won two straight was the bad quarterback play by the other teams. Yeah, the last two games the Vikings have faced, or two of the last three, I'm sorry, Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold had completion percentages under 50%. They were a big reason why we won those games, the poor play by the quarterbacks. The Vikings lost that Cleveland game, if you'll remember, with a quarterback that had a 50% completion percentage. Sam Darnold was 17 for 41 on Sunday against the Vikings, and he managed, and the Carolina Panthers managed to take the Vikings to overtime. I don't care what you think about that win against Carolina or that close loss that the Vikings could have won three plays from being five and one, whatever, whatever the hell the phrase is. Those four quarterbacks we mentioned aren't going to go 17 for 41 no. or, or 26 for 49 or whatever the heck it was Baker Mayfield did against no. the Vikings. Yeah, they're so, going to have to figure something out because there's not going to be any drop off from any of those quarterbacks. They're, they're going to have to come out with a plan, Ted. I mean, we'll have to see what kind of they plan are. they have. Now, Mike Zimmer alluded to the plan being Bashad Breeland, Cameron Dantzler, and Mackenzie Alexander staying in the slot. Are you comfortable with those three as your as your top three cornerbacks right now? Really happy with Mackenzie Alexander this season. 
Yeah. I looked very confident out there. One of the problems with Mac used to be he used to get out of position a lot. And sometimes that would put him in position to, to get a lot of interceptions, but he dropped a lot of interceptions. But he was more like wild before. He was like, I don't know what the word is. You have to mature back there in the secondary a little bit, but he used to be like out of position a lot. He's not, he doesn't do that anymore. He's been playing really well. I think he's a good corner. Breland with a pick on the first play last Sunday. That was pretty nice. I think they should go out and get somebody, Ted. Damn it, you, you, you ruined my Drew question of the week. Oh. <laughs> Let's jump right into the Drew question of the week, shall we? Rashad Breeland's playing better. First three games of the year, quarterbacks had completed 18 passes for 257 yards and four touchdowns Jesus. against him on 21 targets. He was the worst-ranked quarterback in pro football focus. And then Chris Thomason, St. Paul Pioneer press reporter, apparently lit a fire under his ass and got – Everybody all butthurt for asking a very legitimate question. And since then, weeks four through six, there have only been five catches for 43 yards, no touchdowns. He had that pick against the, the Panthers on, on 15 targets, and he has been ranked fourth out of 119 cornerbacks. So that's quite a turnaround in just a few games. Why do people get butthurt over legitimate sports questions, Ted? I don't I don't know. I, I mean, there there's a lot of people on social media trashing Chris Thomason for the question. But could he have maybe phrased it differently? Hey, what do you attribute your slow start to? Maybe okay, but it's it's not wrong to ask a guy. Hey, you're not doing very well. What's going on? I, I mean, that's a kind of a sports reporter 101 question, I would think. Next question. Is it pretty damning when the quarterback of the team comes out and says that we're better off without you? Know? Next question. Drew, why we're never getting into a press conference, are we? Me and you, ever. Well, I've been in a couple, <laughs> but I've been too scared to ask questions like that because I thought I'd get thrown out. You're not really that stupid, are you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, really My best advice to you? Yeah. Shut up. I don't ask anybody's question but yours. You're an idiot. I'll handle this the way I want to handle it now that I'm here. You f***ed it up to begin with. Now just sit there or leave. I don't give a f*** what you do. I going to say, what did you ask? Well, just, I, see, I was like, I was brand new, and I was, like, just trying to kind of pave the way for other blogs to get in, so I didn't want to do anything to upset the apple cart. No, I really didn't care. So I'd, now, yeah, you I'd just, now you walk by and dump the apple cart over and start laughing. <laughs> Let's remind everybody out there watching that everything that we put in our resumes is 100% true. There's no embellishment, Ted. That, that's true. Yeah, we that's agreed. True. When we decided to see those resumes, we decided we got to be honest about it. So when people yeah. see stuff down there and go, Man, Drew's really that much of an idiot. Yeah, I, I did a lot of idiotic things. It's all 100% accurate. I'm proud of them all, Ted. Are you? Are you really? I'm proud of everything I've done. <laughs> Good, bad, or indifferent. That's what she said. Mm. <laughs> Creepy and they're kooky. Welcome to Perpetually 12 with Drew and Ted. <laughs> Here are some of the lines that emotionally immature people have a tendency to come out with in conversation and that should, at the very least, set alarm bells ringing loudly. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's ring in our, what the hell is that? Are you having an epileptic fit? Do we need to take a break? Robert Woods from Titletown, from Hollywood. Oh! He's gonna take a break from making movies, and he's gonna play for Team Ted this week. Perpetually 12 with <laughs> Chris and Ted, yeah, I don't know, whatever. All right, so, we've got Breland, we got Cam Dantzler, we got Mac Alexander. Harrison Hand is is one of the reserves. Are you liking the cornerback room without Peterson? Seems thin to me, Ted. That's not a lot that you just mentioned. I mean, we're supposed to hold down a professional football secondary with those with that with at corner. It's thin. So the the question of the week kind of leads into this, and you've already hinted at it. With Peterson out for a minimum of three games, trade deadline is eleven days away. Vikes have just under four million dollars in cap space. Should Minnesota pursue a trade for somebody? I would. Is there anybody off the top of your head that you think would be a good fit for this team six games into the season that could learn this defense fast? Chris Herndon. Chris Herndon, the tight end. Convert him to a cornerback. Turn him into a corner. Uh, I don't know. What we traded? What did we trade Mike Hughes for? I believe it was a sixth. Well, then we could get him back for a third. I thought it was Mike Hughes and a six for – or Mike Hughes and a seven for a six. I can't remember. But – Oh, it'd be nice to have him around right now, even though he's not really lighting it up in Kansas City. But I don't know. You might have to even dump into next year's draft picks to get somebody. I mean, are you going to get a corner that's going to come in and be a difference maker? No. 
probably not. But you need, by the guys you just mentioned, you need somebody that's got a little bit of experience and who's not a scrub. And if you have to trade a pick from next year to do it, well, I don't know. That, that brings me to the question. You're going to trade a pick for a team? Well, what are we going to finish? Are we a playoff Good team? Question. If we're a playoff team and a contender for the Super Bowl, maybe maybe spend a little more and try to get somebody more proven. You got to get somebody. Here's my thing on the trade. When the Vikings are in situations like this, Rick Spielman tends to, I don't want to say panic, but he tends to panic. Panic all the way. And he overpays. I mean, he did it last year with the Hunter trade. He did it this year with the Irv Smith injury. Or not the Hunter trade, with the Hunter injury when they traded for Yannick Ngakwe. He did it this year for Chris Herndon. I mean, it was um, Zach Ertz went for like a a fifth-round pick and a corner. And the Vikings traded a fourth-round pick for Chris Herndon in like a fifth or a sixth or whatever it was. I, I'm just afraid that, that Rick Spielman is going to get on the phone. Depending on, on the salary of some of these guys, I, there are plenty of guys available, I, I'm, I'm sure. Maybe there's even a street free agent that they could go look at. But I don't think a free agent that hasn't played all year is going to be the guy the Vikings are going to look to first, but I don't know. I just think if they get on the line with somebody and somebody's willing to make a deal, he's going to give up a much higher pick Probably. than he normally would have to. And I don't think he has to in this situation. Well, if you're going to get a guy that's just going to stand on the sideline and be another Harrison Hand, why trade anything for him? Just go get somebody off the free agent scrap heap. Why don't you call Carolina? There's a team that has four starting corners on their team. That Go get that Bouye. Bouye. Go get that guy. A.J. Bouye? Go get him. Teams that are overloaded in the position, they got a lot of corners there. When Gilmore comes back, they're going to have four starters, Ted. Go talk to them and get one of their guys. What would you be willing to give up for one of Carolina's starting cornerbacks? Something creepy and spooky and altogether ooky. <laughs> Cousin Maybe that Ed. hand. What was a hand <laughs> thing? What's it called? <laughs>
and and these guys need to rotate and match up and because this guy's going to go and that's exactly what happened sure. I, I, and that that's a level of experience Breland and and Cameron Dantzler are not going to be able to match they just aren't but when you look at ability I think they can do it if they are coached up and the Vikings game plan properly to a point but still you're going to have to expect that they're going to give up a big play I mean because you're, you're looking at at these offenses these are just I don't want to say unstoppable offenses, but very, very good offenses. You're not going to completely shut them down. You just have to be able to keep them from getting in the end zone when they get down into the red zone, I would think. And I I would argue that those guys could do it as, as long as they stay healthy. The Vikings secondary has been saved this season, probably not only by the coaching back there, Harrison Smith and Patrick Peterson, but probably from the defensive line. If the Vikings yeah. defensive line wasn't pressuring the quarterback as well as they were, that secondary would be just torn to pieces. So a lot is going to be relying on the next four games with the big guns. We'll just call it the big gun schedule that uh, I guess the D-line has to keep. The front seven in itself has to play out of their minds to protect the secondary a little bit. Yeah. But you're right. If you think they can get it done, then get it done. But you don't want to go spend a high pick on a, a team that's going to finish, you know, 8-9 and nine or 7-10. and 10. Yeah, that, and that's the thing. I don't want to waste a pick on a guy that's essentially going to be a, a, a one or two year rental. And if they don't do well coming out of the buy and they're essentially out of it, right? Then now you've lost that draft pick and you've got this player and the coach's staff is probably going to get fired and the GM's probably going to get fired. And now did that for essentially nothing. Vikings really need to make a calculated decision as whether or not they're buyers or sellers at uh, the trade deadline and act accordingly. And we'll see what happens. Makes a lot of sense. All righty. Yes. So. You rang. <laughs> you rang. You rang. <laughs> pretty good at that. That's pretty good. That's not bad. Speaking of ringing, let's uh, <laughs> let's let's ring in our. <laughs> what was that? Are you having an epileptic fit? Do we need to take a break? No, you didn't. That was good. That was good corner discussion. We actually sounded like we knew what we were talking about. I, I hope so. All right, so we're going to go with what we got. So Dallas, Dallas doesn't have any receivers anyway. Let's go with what we got. Yeah, it's, it's just Amari Cooper and CeeDee Lamb. Those guys are bums. Terrible. So this week uh, in fantasy football, we kicked the ever-loving hell out of the boys over at Vikings Uncensored. I mean, we were just a couple of big, hairy winning machines this week is what we were <laughs> funny. And nobody can hang with my stuff. Uh, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just a big, hairy American winning machine. If you ain't first, you're last. Shake a bake. <laughs> Big hairy winning machines. Yeah. Yeah, we beat them by we beat them by a good margin this week to bring us to three and three. It's like the Vikings. We are now three and three. We we made it to our buy at three and three. So our, our chances of going to the playoffs have now increased to almost forty percent. Dude, we rolled up two hundred and thirty eight points between mine and your teams this week, Ted. That's pretty good. Damn good. That's pretty good. You're damn good football managers right there. All right, for our season-long fantasy football contest that we have going between Drew, Ruby, and myself, I believe I won uh, rather decisively over you two. And now that gives us both, or all three of us, we all have two victories on the year. So I have two wins, Drew has two wins, and Tunsis has two wins. Ready? One, two, three. Do, 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 do. Yep, we all have two wins, so we're spreading it out accordingly. So nobody knows you can't just pick from one person. We're all winning. So how this works. So what we're about to do is we're going to pick a quarterback, a running back, two wide receivers, and one tight end for the week. We can only pick that player one time. Uh, if we've already picked him, we, we, can we can't do it again. We are using a standard PPR scoring format. You guys look at our three different teams. Decide who you think is going to win for the week, and then in the comments below, tell us. This week, I'm Team Ted, I'm Team Toonses, or I'm Team Drew. If you pick the right team, you get one point. The person that has the most points at the end of the season wins a prize from the world-famous Vikings Report with Drew and Ted prize vault. It is world-famous. We've been voted the number one prize <laughs> vault. No, we are voted the number one prize vault. We are also voted something over the weekend, I forgot to tell you, after the live show. Yeah, We were voted number one most watched podcast from the Sacramento County Jail Cells. It's, it's, a, it's a major award. A major award. <laughs> In the Sacramento <laughs> County Jail, we were number one. We were the most watched show from county. It's a major award. So, <laughs> this is what you win, and we have a secret prize. We're not telling you what that is, though. It's oh, a yeah. tufa. 
Remember to Tufa. That's right. There's two prizes. But we're not going to let you know what the other prize is. Just keep playing. Like the 11 people that played for Team Ted last week, 11 more wins last week. Yeah. So the prize, it's and we're we're putting a picture of it up on the screen. It's it's a wooden plaque of eight Minnesota Vikings great football cards. It's really cool. Very nice collectible item. I, I as a Vikings fan, I think you'll uh, you'll really enjoy it. Hanging it on your on your Vikings wall down down in your Vikings room or out in your garage or give it to your kids or your grandkids, whatever. It's a great prize. All right. This week, Drew Bunting, who is your fantasy football team? (laughs) My quarterback is Kyler Murray. My running back is Alvin Kamara of the Saints. My one of my wide receivers is Robert Woods of the Rams. My other wide receiver is Mike Evans from the Buccaneers. And my tight end is the unicorn, Kyle Pitts from the Falcons. Ooh. That is my starting five for the Fantasy Football Challenge this week. Rui, who do you have? All right. This week I'm going with Matt Stafford, Aaron Jones, Marquise Brown, Cordell Patterson, and Darren Waller. Pretty good lineup. All right. Robert W. Fosworth, yeah? No! <laughs> Coach Farnsworth is going to read us his list. A crackerjack lineup, indeed. <laughs> this week, Team Ted has just a crackerjack of a lineup. <laughs> the dastardly Aaron Rodgers is his quarterback. Oh, no. <laughs> Followed by promising rookie Chuba Hubbard is the running back. <laughs> Chuba Hubbard. That's how you would see it, too. Battery mate Devontae Adams compliments Aaron Rodgers, another dastardly player for that evil, evil team from Green Bay. Robert Woods from Titletown from Hollywood. Oh, he's going to take a break from making movies and he's going to play for Team Ted this week. <laughs> and finally, Super Bowl champion Travis Kelsey, known for pottying across the world, <laughs> will be his title. <laughs> yeah. I'm done with that guy. <laughs> oh, Robert Farnsworth. That is a regular for the show. Robert man. W. Farnsworth signing off. <laughs> All right, so that is our fantasy segment for the week. Now, normally in this spot, we would do our game preview. Since the Vikings are on a on a bye this week, we're going to still roll out our game preview chart. But what we're going to do is we're going to go over each position, and we're going to give the Vikings a grade and kind of discuss how we think the Vikings have done up to this point at those positions. As you can see, Ruby's got the preview screen up, and we are going to start out, as we always do, with quarterback. Drew, what are your thoughts on Kirk Cousins as quarterback through six games? Kirk Cousins, he, I'm giving him an A. All righty. A two-game winning drives that probably should have been four. If you look at the, the Arizona game and the Cincinnati game, those were game-winning drives right there. So he's probably had four under his belt at this point. 69% completion rate, 295 yards a game. He has 13 touchdowns and only two picks and an overall passer rating of 105.4. Let's be honest, Ted. The O-line isn't that much better than it was last year. He's doing a lot of it on his own. He's yes. getting rid of the ball sooner. I think he's uh, making more decisive choices better, and I think he has a lot of trust in his receivers. He's got a really good group of receivers right now. I'm giving him an A, Ted. I, I am too, and the stats are the stats, and the numbers are the numbers. Kirk always has put up good numbers, and, and we kind of thought a lot of them were dubious for, for multiple reasons. One of them was that when it came down to absolutely making a drive when it mattered, the Vikings offense could not do it. Now, was some of that blame unduly put on Kirk? A couple times, yeah. But when you're the quarterback and and you touch the football every offensive play, you're going to get that criticism, fair or not. And there were some times throughout his career as a Viking that, that Kirk just flat out didn't get it done. And this year he is getting it done every single week. Took the Vikings down the field to tie the game at Cincinnati. Took the Vikings down the field to potentially win the game in Arizona, but Greg Joseph missed a kick. Beat the Tar out of Seattle. Had a bad game against Cleveland, but everybody did. And then I'm missing a game in there somewhere, but he he had a game-winning drive yesterday in overtime to to beat Carolina, and he made an absolute money, money throw to K.J. Osborne. And if you look, there was a – somebody took a still 
and and every one of the big criticisms of Kirk is that he'll take the safe play and he'll take the check down. Oh, we got the still. We we located it. Let, let's put that up. If you'll see, Adam Thielen is wide open in the middle of the field. About it looks like the whatever yard line it is, twenty twenty five. It would have been an easy completion. Would have got the Vikings down well within field goal range. But Kirk didn't check that down. He looked downfield, saw KJ Osborne breaking free, and went for the home run. And he hit it, and the scored a touchdown, and the Vikings won ball game. That to me is the big difference in Kirk Cousins this year, and I love it. That's why I gave him an A. It's just me. This is his best season as a Viking. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Running game. I'll take this one, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give the Vikings running game an A. I mean, I they know. are they are top ten in the NFL when Dalvin Cook is hurt. Alexander Madison has stepped in very capably, has rushed for over 100 yards twice this year. And in Dalvin Cook's absence, I think the Vikings have a very good running game. I think the Vikings offensive line uh, does a very good job opening holes for Dalvin Cook and Alexander Madison. I, I liked what I've seen a lot. It's a, it's a very, very good running offense this year. So I gave it an A. For this positional vote, Ted, I'm going to take into consideration the fact that uh, our number one running back missed two games. So I okay. think that you have to over the course of the first six. That's a big loss for the Vikings. But Alexander Madison, man, that guy has done a bang-up job at his number two role coming in this season. 68 carries, 268 yards, good for a 4.0 average. And he's also caught 88% of the passes thrown to him. 15 out of 17. 17 targets, caught 15. He's just been great. He's been a, a great fill-in guy. He's like a starter that fills in. He could probably start somewhere else. Cook, so dynamic, as we saw last Sunday. He's a difference maker when he gets the ball. We all know what he's yeah. about. He missed two games. He's still got 366 yards on the ground. Averages 91 a game still. The Vikings have the eighth-ranked rushing attack, like you said. I gave him a B plus. Okay. What about the receiving game? Big three, Ted. I got a tasty, tasty, I got a tasty, <laughs> Go ahead. What is it? What do you got? Brooklyn has 240 yards receiving so far after six games. Kyle Rudolph only did that twice in his tenure, in his 10 years here with the Vikings. Really? In his first six games, he only managed to get 240 plus twice, 2016 and 2018. Gronklin has 240 right now, so good. that's a little tasty tidbit I wanted to throw in. I thought that was a good stat. He's been more than capable of doing – Kind of a doubling the role though the Irv Smith went down. We thought it was going to be a weak spot. Mm -hmm. I really don't even know why they went out and got Herndon as well as Gronklin's been playing. Well, because Chris Herndon, you know, he, for every single catch he's made has been a touchdown. <laughs> Chris Carter Herndon. And the big three, what can you say? 1,246 yards, Ted, between all between KJ Osborne, Jefferson, and Thielen. That's good for around 200 yards a game. I think Cousins loves having those receivers. I think he trusts them a lot. And I think he doesn't have a problem throwing to any of them. He doesn't have a worry in the world. My grade is A for the receivers. Yeah, I gave him an A as well. The big question coming into the season was, do the Vikings have a legitimate third wide receiver? And most everybody thought it was going to be B.C. Johnson. And then he, I believe, tore his ACL early in training camp and was out for the year. And it just looked like another void in talent after the top two guys and to kj osborne's credit and you and i were not fans of his last year and in the offseason neither, neither right. one of us thought he he should stick around or was going to be able to make the team not only has he made the team he gave the vikings a, a legitimate third wide receiver option and i'm telling you that that kid has really done a 180 and i'm i'm so happy for him and i'm so happy i was wrong about him and he's one of the main reasons. I mean, JJ and, and Adam Thielen are are who they are, and they're they're both elite talents at wide receiver. But I'm really happy for for KJ Osborne, who has stepped up and answered a big question in the Vikings offense. So, a imagine what these receivers are going to be like when we get a shredding OC. Yeah, no kidding. Offensive line, I'm giving them a C. I, I think they're okay in opening up holes for the running game. Their pass protection is still not where it needs to be. They've looked – at times they've looked really good. At times they've looked really bad. You can look at maybe the Arizona game was probably an A. The Cleveland game was probably an F. And the other four games have been somewhere in between. And I, it just kind of averages out to a C average for me. So 
That's what I give them. I have the offensive line at a C plus. Okay. Because they didn't have their starting left tackle all those games. They really only got their lunch handed to them twice. Uh, the Cincy game and the Cleveland game, they got overpowered. They got overpowered more in the Cleveland game. Cincy game, it was uh, like a combination of penalties plus getting run over. It just didn't have a good game that opening that opening week. But those are really two of the poor performances they had. Otherwise, you know what they say, Ted? They say when, when the pudding hits the road, how's that go? The proof's in the, <laughs> when the tire hits the pudding, when the pudding proof's in the pudding. When the rubber meets the pudding. When the rubber meets the pudding. You know what they say, Ted? Nine, <laughs> sack, nine sacks allowed. Nine sacks allowed is up near the top of the league. And when it comes yeah. down to it, that's a big number. I know they give up a lot of hurries. I know they give up a lot of, what's the other, like pressures. Pressure. Pressures and hurries are bad, but sacks, they've only given up nine all season. So I was floating around between B- minus and C+, plus, and I decided to go C+. Plus with the uh, offensive line. Okay. How do you see them going forward now with Christian Derrissaw? I see him doing nothing but improving. Okay. If they go three and one in the next four, which would be probably a miracle, a lot of it will be because the offensive line has come together and they're playing. You get the offensive and the defensive line playing well together, you can win games. Um, and I think if, they, if they're going to have any, any, any success this next month, they need to have Cousins play at that top rate that he's at. The O line's got to come through, especially in the run game. But that's what Darius That's what he does, Ted. He's a run. He's a run grader. All right. So, what do you got for the defensive line? How about this? We throw this graphic up to start off with the defensive line about the All sacks. Right. Okay. Let's throw that up there. There we go. What? How about that? From 28th in the league last year, Ted, to number one. That's a pretty good turnaround. Which in German is numero uno. That's how you say it in German. <laughs> <laughs> want to cover that a little bit, let people know of my language prowess. Number one. In, in That's impressive. 28 to number one. I think a lot of credit has to be given at this point, six games in, to the sack daddy Griff and Hunter. What, what a year for the, our defensive ends are having already. Hunter's on pace for 20 sacks. He has six right now. Sack daddy has four. Defensive line has played really well in terms of pressuring the quarterback. I could not give him an A, though, because of the horrid run defense they've had up till now. That eliminated from an AA side to give him a B because the run defense is still a work in progress, Ted. I, I gave him a C plus mostly because of the run defense. They they cannot stop anybody consistently running the ball. But I, I wish I could almost give him two grades here because the amount of pressure they're bringing in passing situations has been incredible. A complete 180 from last year. I mean, last year quarterbacks could stand uh, stand in the pocket and do their taxes before they had to throw a football, and this year they just don't have time that they had last year. But but that run defense is just, you know, Michael Michael Pierce and Dalvin Thomas were brought in specifically to shore up the run defense and it's it's just not getting home. It's it's not doing its job. I I think they've gotten marginally better as the season has gone on, but they are still nowhere near where they need to be. And coming out of the bye, you've got Dallas Cowboys with Ezekiel Elliott and then you've got the Baltimore Ravens with Lamar Jackson and that that's going to be a couple of big tests for that run defense. So that's why I gave him a C plus. Very, very big test for the linebackers. I got to say, I haven't really been all that impressed. I'm, I'm, I'm giving them a, a C minus. Actually, Eric Kendricks has has had a couple of splash plays. Nick Vigil has had a couple of splash plays. Anthony Barr is finally back to playing after like a, over a year of being out. They just haven't looked. Especially, Bar well, and Barr's only played two games. Kendricks has is, is kind of seen a dip, I think, in, in his overall play. It's just been average. I don't think I can give him anything more to see. What about you? I gave him a C, a flat C. Kendricks is fifth in tackles. I understand what you're saying that, you know, you're kind of down on the year he's had, but that guy does so much away from the football when he's on the field. In terms of keeping people aligned, he's really good in coverage. He's very active. He's a smart player. I think if you took him off, we wouldn't win any games. He maybe he's not playing at the level he's had the last couple of seasons, but that level's been like astronomical. He, he may be falling off just a tad. I understand it, but uh, I think he's still playing at a really good level. Seems like every week he almost gets an interception or gets an interception. Vigil was MVP filling in for Barr. I think he did a great job, but they have no depth at linebacker. They're I don't know what's going to happen if guys start getting hurt. So it's been an average performance up till now. 
And, and let's let's face it, the D line can't get all the blame for that run defense, Ted. Some has no. to fall on the linebackers. It it does, yeah. And and that you know, and that goes back to one of the reasons I gave him a C. I mean, usually they're they're so good, and it's this is probably more on Nick Vigil than than anybody. But you know, one of the things the Vikings defense is predicated on is the line defensive line eating up the blockers, linebackers filling the gap, and then making the play. And that's not happening with the regularity it has in years past. And then right. even if they are, they seem to be missing a lot more tackles or opportunities for tackles and tackles for losses or minimal gains than they have in the past. I mean, I, it just seems like the Vikings miss a lot on that first opportunity to tackle a guy, and that results in another five, six, or more yards on the play when they could really turn that into a negative play or, or I guess if you want to call it a very positive play for the Vikings defense. Can you tell me what's going on since we're talking about the linebackers real quick with Chaz Surratt? I'd like to see him play. Why yeah. Is he not, where is he? Pretty sure he was inactive again against both him and Patrick what, Jones. Injury? I mean, why is he inactive? No, they just, you know, they apparently feel that the guys they have going right now are good enough. And I, I don't know why that is. I, I think both Surratt and Patrick Jones II second played pretty decent football in the preseason. I get it's the competition they were going up against, but I'd like to see what they have in those guys going forward because they were both third-round picks, I believe, and they both came out of college, you know, with, with pretty decent pedigrees. So, I, yeah, I don't know what the deal is. I'd like to see them get on the field and, and just see what they have. Me too. All right, Drew, what do you got as a, as a season grade for the secondary? <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I'm going to be nice and just get by it. I'm going to tell you right now, if it wasn't for Snoop Dogg, Robbie Anderson, dropping a bunch of passes, they probably would have got torched even more. I'm giving them a D for the season. I haven't been impressed with anything they've done back there. Giving up too many big plays, Ted. Rondale Moore, nobody around him runs in for an easy touch. Those type of things have been happening way too much. I think it has gotten a slightly a smidge better over the course of the last couple games, but they still get a D. And let me tell you something. I'm not going to get upset and throw F-bombs. We're going to get through this quick. That fourth down and 10, 41-yard pass to a tight end break of the seam is fireable. It's if an I'm, if I'm, if I, I would fire the coach over that because that, when that play, when Darnold threw that pass to a tight end, no less, not a wide receiver, not a wide receiver, a tight end. For a 41-yard gain to take out to the 45 on fourth and 10, I don't even, you can give me a better word for it because it angers me. I should give him an F because of that one play. <laughs> I give him a D. I'm giving him a C minus. They started off the season with an F. And we talked about Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold having bad days against the Vikings. If Sam Darnold's receivers do him justice and catch some passes, this game could have very well had a different outcome. Right. If Baker, if Baker Mayfield hits three or four more guys and three or four more passes on guys that were – I mean, let's just face it, they had beaten their guy and they were open. If he makes those throws, the Vikings probably lose that game even worse than they did. That said, they're getting better. I mean, Patrick Peterson is playing a lot better. Bashad Breeland has, has really improved his play the last three games. Cameron Dantzler seemed to be coming on, then had to go on the COVID list, and now is back. You can see the makings of a respectable secondary, but now – just when you think they're they're starting to make headway, Patrick Peterson gets injured. So I'm giving them a C minus, and we'll see what happens moving forward. But yeah, they've they've been underwhelming. I'm surprised that you gave them that tech. A C's average, right? Is that what it is in school? C is yeah. average. Yeah. So you consider them the first six games of the season an average play? Just slightly below average, C minus. Yeah. I mean, you can say, well, yeah, Sam Darnold went 17 for 41, and his receivers. Could have caught some passes, but the flip side, to defend the secondary, they put a blanket on those receivers for the better part of yesterday, and Darnold had very tight windows to throw in. And the Panthers' wide receivers, you know, Robbie Anderson, they're, they're, they're good players. If you look at some of the highlights and, and some of the snippets on, on Twitter from guys that break stuff down, the secondary did their job, and they allowed the, the defensive line to get in there and get pressure, and it was they were playing – complimentary football for for a good part of the afternoon so i, I yeah i'm not i'm gonna give him a c minus i'm not questioning your grading system now you're the teacher so <laughs> i i just wanted you to explain it to the drister a little more because uh you ain't grading on a big curve right there brother 
I've I'm all, I've always been a Santa Claus as an evaluator and a grader. I always have. Yeah. I always, yeah. When I was an instructor and an evaluator, I'm an evaluator now when I do stuff in the classroom. I'm a Santa Claus. That's creepy and ooky, dude. <laughs> it's altogether spooky. What do we got for red zone? I'm giving the I'm giving the Vikings a B overall. I think offense could be a little bit more efficient. Defense, yeah, not too bad, but but they're not as terrible as some units. I'm giving them an overall B. I have them down as a B minus. They have a pretty decent offense in the red zone, Ted. They're 10th in the red zone offense in the NFL. 12 touchdowns on 18 trips. I think it could be better, though. I think that's why I had to go B- minus because I think they should be an A in the red zone. When okay. you have an experienced quarterback in the same system with the same players, you can only go so far as to saying, why can't you figure it out down there? When it, That Carolina game, those first two drives, when they had to settle for field goals, it makes me scratch my head going, these guys have played together long enough to know what the hell works down there. Part of the reason I gave them a B is because I'm not putting all of the special team fault on the players. And I'll explain why when we get to the coaching. So we're on special teams now. Yeah, go ahead with, with special teams. I know they gave up that horrible blocked punt that turned into points for the Panthers. But in the first six games, Ted, I really don't have a problem with anything with the special teams. Except for... I guess missing a game-winning field goal is kind of big. Maybe I do have a little bit of a problem. A little bit of two, two. Three. They haven't been gashed for any long runs in the uh, return game, though, this year. And last year I was really worried about them. We're giving up a lot of return yardage, it seemed. You know what they still have too much? They have too many penalties on their returns. They always have a holding or a block in the back. they got to clean that up. I gave the special teams a C plus. I gave the special teams a D. Did you? Greg Joseph has missed too many field goals, especially in game-winning situations. They gave up a punt block for a touchdown yesterday. So, like, in the Army, we had we had this saying. <laughs> I love it. Here we go. We, we had this saying, and it was, it was one off shit. One off shit cancels out a thousand attaboy. This is what I mean by that. Jordan Berry, the Minnesota Vikings punter, having a pretty good season. Averaging 48 yards a kick has pinned the Viking or Vikings opponents fairly deep a couple times, most notably yesterday against the Panthers on that last two-minute drive that the Panthers went down and scored 96, went 96 yards and scored on. He's got all those attaboys, but then the Vikings punt team gives up a block punt for a touchdown, and one-off shit cancels a 1,000 attaboys. That makes perfect sense, though. That explains that a lot to me. Dede Westbrook is an adventure. Every oh. time he goes to catch a punt, and I'm sorry, adventure is not the adjective you need to be describing your punt return when he goes to catch it. Maybe when he catches it and secures the ball and heads up field, like maybe Percy Harvin used to do on kick returns or Marcus Sherrill's, but I'm not a fan of D.D. Westbrook. The punt block was bad. The field goal kicking has not been as good as it needs to be. I don't care about kickoffs. Everybody kicks it into the end zone these days, so I'm giving them a D. Now I feel bad for giving him a C plus after all that. <laughs> all right. Now it's coaching. Drew Punting? We always no, you gotta laugh with me. We always laugh at the beginning of the coaching <laughs> thing every week. The Minnesota Vikings are three and three. I would argue the Minnesota Vikings are three and three not because of the coaching, but in spite of the coaching. We have gone over this ad nauseum, but I mentioned the red zone why I wasn't downgrading the Vikings' red zone efficiency a little bit more. Their very first possession in the red zone yesterday, they got fourth and two, I believe. They were fourth and two on the six. And I said, look, you're facing a top defense. You need to get touchdowns whenever you have an opportunity. You have Dalvin Cook. You have Adam Thielen. You've got Justin Jefferson. You guys, you mentioned. Tyler Conklin is, is even becoming a weapon now. K.J. Osborne. They have multiple options when you're down there and to just kind of give up and kick a field goal there, knowing yes, it's sir. probably going to come back and haunt you and bite you in the ass at some mm -hmm. point is almost inexcusable. And people are, well, but Ted, it was only the first quarter. You got to take the points. No, you have to play to win. And this Minnesota, oh, no, win? you got to take the points. He has. Tutsis, look at him. <laughs> oh, you got to play, you got to take the points. No. You have got to play to win the game. 
So if you play to win the game, then I think you go for a touchdown there. And and the Vikings don't. They play not to lose. And when you add in, we could throw in a bunch of stuff, but the, the other thing that just irks me with this staff is they just seem to give up in the last two minutes of the half. They've been outscored. The Vikings have been outscored 38 to 10. And there's just this, this incompetence the last two minutes of the half, whether they're on defense or on offense trying to score. They give up points and they can't score points. I'm giving this coaching staff a D. I mean, it's like the Vikings are three and three. They've had two exciting wins in a row, and I still want the coaching staff to get fired at the end of the year. You said it well at the beginning. How'd you say in spite of the coaching staff, they're three and three? That's so accurate. I'm not happy with the coaching staff. I, I don't know if that's a surprise to you at this point in this show after 38 episodes. I don't think anybody's surprised. I think it's the system is holding the Vikings back. From Zimmer's wussy ass approach to the in the weird press conference things and the sayings he has and everything, he seems lost out there. And not taking responsibility for anything. I'm used to guys like Dennis Green and Bud Grant, who, who the first thing they say at the microphone is, "This starts with me." Yeah. And then the, only the first sentence. And then if you want to break it down and ask questions, that's fine. I never hear him say that. What did he say today? Do you hear what happened today? I I did not know. I think this team needs to learn how to put people away when they have a lead. I did see that, yeah. And I th- Are you kidding? You're telling me that. You're telling everybody that. You! Talk about a lack of self-awareness. The, the person that needs to learn how to put people away, it starts with the head coach. Shouldn't he say that, though? I need to teach my team how to. That's, he doesn't do anything through that scope. It's not, I need to do this to translate it to my team to get my team to do this better. I, it starts with me on teaching them or telling them how to do it. It all goes in order of that. He doesn't do it like, he goes, comes out and says, well, you know, I'm psyched, our kicker sucks. He never takes any accountability, and that bugs me, dude. Me too. Any sports, any team that you're rooting for in any sport, the head coach should take accountability. And I still think, I still think Kubiak's in way over his head. I don't think he's calling it the way he wants to. I think he's just doing whatever Zimmer wants to tell him to do. I have an interesting thing that I looked at today that I wanted to get your opinion on in terms of the coaching, and I'll be, I'll keep this very brief. Sure. When we played Cleveland, we had seven points and no offense. Yeah. As the great Jim Morris Sr. would say, Ted, we couldn't do diddly poo. <laughs> Remember his diddly poo press conference when yeah. we couldn't do anything right? Yeah. He had seven points in nothing against the Browns. That was a stalemate, stagnant, slothy game. The next week, the Browns gave up 47 to the Chargers. The next week, last Sunday, they gave up 37 to the Cardinals. 47 to the Brown to the Chargers. 37 to the Cardinals, back-to-back weeks, Browns defense. Vikings got seven with no offense, and they got seven points. Now, that being said, do you think those two teams that scored 47 and 34, 47 and 37, do you think they have a better offense than we do? Personnel-wise, just players. No, I think the Vikings match up very well with both those offenses. Chargers and the Cardinals, who scored 47 and 37. Yes. Then how do you explain only getting seven? This is what I think is going on. I think the Vikings only start airing it out when they have to. When they get into a track meet, then Zim tells Kubiak, unleash it, you know, release the Kraken, whatever, whatever it is you want to say. And they have, and they start slinging it. When they don't have to, they don't. They play a very ball control offense, time of possession offense, and field position. And when you're up 28 17 with five minutes left to go, you quit going for the jugular. This is a telling quote by Adam Thielen. And, and I think this goes directly back to the coaching staff. He was asked about that block punt. He said, you know, that block punt really kind of got us out of our doldrums and, and we kind of gave us a sense of urgency to get going and to start playing. Why do you need something like that to happen to you to get going and get playing well? Why don't you have that sense of urgency coming out of the gate? With the first drive, I don't understand why you need something to spark you to play well. That's the way the Zimmer era has gone. Exactly yeah. what you say. Go ahead, finish your thought. And so why do you need something to happen to you? Why can't you just get that sense of urgency and go, you know, full throttle from the opening kickoff? I don't get it. I just I just don't get that approach that you got to wait for something to somebody to kick you in the teeth before, oh, oh, oh. 
oh, we got to start playing football now. Well, why? That last drive against the Lions, why not just do that during the game? Yeah. So I gave him a D. <laughs> what would you give him? No, I gave him a D, too. Okay. Uh, one right. thing I'll add in there, though, did we have clock management problems when he started head coaching here in 2014? Um, uh, I think it's always been an issue, and it just seems to have been exacerbated the last few years. It's always been an issue. Think about the sentence you just said. If it's always an issue after eight years, it means you're not working on it. That's true. That means you're not working on When you have an issue with something, you work on it to get better at it. The fact that he's bad at it every year shows that he's not working on it. And that's a detail. Of, that's what you're supposed to do. Work on the things you're not good at. Yeah. Fair point. That's very fair. Finally, intangibles. My favorite topic, by the way. Intangibles. So, Drew, why don't you give us the intangibles? Why don't you start off with intangibles? I'll go with B. I don't really know how to grade intangibles because I'm, yeah, really really, I'm not really that intelligent of an individual. I don't know if you've noticed. I gave it a B. I'm going to throw this out there, Ted. This is kind of a weird stat. The Vikings defense has faced 72 third downs on the season, their defense. They've allowed 21 conversions for a 29% conversion rate, which is number one in the NFL. Is Am I wrong? Did I read that wrong tonight? No, that's correct. And that is a fantastic stat for their defense. That is one trait of a Mike Zimmer defense throughout his entire time here. The Vikings defense has always been top three, four, five. Even last year in, in that 2020 debacle, they were still a top third down unit getting off the field. Well, whatever he's doing with that, translate it over to the clock management. <laughs> you? No, I thought that was a pretty cool. That's kind of an intangible, but I'm giving him a B. The Vikings are sitting on a dynamite weaponry of gold mine. I probably said that backwards. But if they had an OC and a head coach that were just thinking outside the box with these weapons, especially with Osborne thrown in the mix, the Vikings could be unstoppable, dude. I think so, yeah. They could be unreadable for defensive coordinators, unstoppable for players, because they wouldn't be able to figure out their identity. Their identity's always been, without Cook, they can't do anything. As soon as they get a program to evolve with opening up the box, they are going to be a Dino Mike! Jimmy Walker type offense, man. Really wasn't sure how to how to grade intangibles. I, I think they've got a tough schedule coming out of the bye. That's an intangible they're going to have to deal with. They've got a good home field advantage. That's an intangible that, that, that helps them. Most of these coaching matchups is going to go against them in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, I don't see Mike Zimmer being the, the smarter guy on the sideline for a majority of the games left. I just saw I averaged it out, <laughs> gave him a C. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do there. But you're absolutely right about the offense and the defense, and the defense has improved, and that's all good. I just, yeah, you see. Good enough. So that's our, our Vikings midseason report, one-third of the way through the year. We'll yeah. take a quick commercial break and come back for trivia and wrap the show up. I want to tell you about a neighborhood market called McCoy's. McCoy's has no games, so you don't pay for them. McCoy's has no fancy frills, so you don't pay for them. This means McCoy's is able to give you the one thing you want most, the finest meats, produce, and name brand products at the lowest possible prices. Save even more this week. Pork spare ribs, medium size, 88 cents a pound. Bananas, 15 cents a pound. McCoy's, no fancy frills, just lower prices. Charlie, another fall staff, please. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. There it is, Ted. Instructional, instructional video for the Air Force. <laughs> da, really da, da, da. Okay, here we go. So you want to be an in-flight refueling operator. <laughs> Hello, guys. Welcome to Toonsis Trivia. How are you guys doing? Good, Toonsis. How are you? I'm good. Today, we are going to do the same as we've been doing all season. First category is going to be about the TV show we're doing, Adam's Family. And then we're going to have some trivia about the Vikings to week six. And then Who Am I, which is a visual category. All right. All right. Who won last week? We did. Let's see if you can win this week. We did. Yeah, All right, ready? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. What is Morticia's man-eating plant name? Uh, is it Aristotle? No. I don't know. 
Cleopatra. I was on the right track. To call you were. You were. All right. What was their street address? Was Mockingbird? That was the Munsters, right? Mockingbird Lane. Oh, was it the Munsters? Was Mockingbird Lane the Munsters? Yeah, I think that was the Munsters. I don't know where the Adams family live. What's the Vikings address in Egan? That's We'll use that. <laughs> All right. Once again, you guys suck at this category. We kind of do. Zero 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 one Cemetery Lane. All right. The Adams family had a sign in front of their mansion. What did it say? It's like "Go away" or something like that, or "Abandon all hope, all ye who enter here." Something weird like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going go with that. Beware of, of the thing. Whatever. I was close. Yeah. <laughs> I guessed Aristotle on the planet too. All right. Last chance. What was Wednesday's middle name? I don't know, but when she got older, she married a porn star. Wasn't it like Tuesday? Wasn't it, it? It was another day of the week, wasn't it? Yes. Let's go with Tuesday then. Wednesday, tu- Wednesday, Tuesday. Friday. Whatever. That was family stupid, anyways. She married a porn <laughs> guy, though. I know that. that that's that information. excellent information, Drew. Thanks. Yeah, she did. All right. <laughs> the Vikings through week six. First question. We're going to sweep this. I think you will, too. Who's the only player that has a pick six this year? Nick Vigil. Yeah. Good job. (laughs) (laughs) Who has the most solo tackles so far? Perpetually 12. (laughs) Uh, Drew, you know this one? Yes, I I do. Wait for you to get it. And my answer would be like Eric Hendrick, probably. It's got to be Kendricks or Harrison Smith. You got to guess the guy that has the most tackles, and Kendricks has 60. So it's a logical choice, but it's probably a trick question. So we'll see. I'll go Kendricks. Harrison Smith. Ah, It's either Kendricks or Harrison Smith. All right. Who has the most QB hits so far this year? I'm going to go with uh, Sack Daddy. Okay. Yeah. Daniel Hunter. Darn it. That seemed like a trick question. Though. I told you not to listen to me, Ted. I told you not to listen to me, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you've only got one out of seven so far. Let's see if you can get this one. Well, we don't like to leave our standards very high. Then you'll expect a lot out of us every week. So we keep the standards low. That's a good idea. Which player has the highest catch percentage so far? What do you got, Drew? Amir Abdullah, 1,000%. He's caught everything. Okay. I was going to say either, either like... Uh... KJ Osborne or, or uh, Conklin, but we'll go with Abdullah. CJ Ham has 100%. CJ Ham. <laughs> dastardly, dastardly stat. <laughs> All right, this next category, is, or I'm going to show you a picture of a Viking player. These are lesser known Viking players, and you just tell me who it is. Here we go with the first one. Who am I? Um, geez. Uh, <laughs> um, Breland? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, lesser known though. He's a starter sometimes. So, um, probably not Greg Joseph. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say Greg Joseph? I said probably not Greg Joseph. Oh, being funny. Chris Boyd. Chris Boyd. All right, that's good. Yeah, Chris Boyd. Well, well there you go. That is Chris All right. Boyd. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where do we go now? <laughs> Who's that? That's Ted Glover. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know who that is. That's uh, looks like Bradbury, doesn't it? It does look like Bradbury. Let's go with that. Oh, so close, Blake Brandell. Okay. All right. Who am I? Todd Bridges. <laughs> Todd Bridges. <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> <laughs> Nate Wright. <laughs> 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 Who is 43 on the bike? We don't even know the roster, bro. Yeah, that's a bad. I, it's um, Harrison Hand. Either Harrison so Hand or Harrison Hand. Cameron Bynum. All right. Oh, from Cal. The Rook yeah. Dog. Rook Dog from Cal. All right, last one. Who am I? Mm, Martin Lawrence. Damn, oh. Tina. Oh. <laughs> 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 Who is that, Ted? Rashad Hill is going to be my guess. Can, uh, uh, Chris Herndon. Drew! Good job! Nice! Thank you for playing. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Tunes. Thanks, Tunes. All right. That'll about do it for episode 38. Drew, Ruby, thanks again. As the season progresses, we're just getting more and more popular, it seems. It's great. I love it. 
thank you so much to everybody that sends in questions for trivia or interacts with us on the live post game show or comments on the show. Participate in our fantasy football contest. Really, truly do appreciate it. Thank you, Tunes and Liz, for the the post production efforts you guys do every week. Drew, to you as well. I, I can't say enough good things about about the team we got here at, at Vikings Report. Thanks to Chris Gates for joining us for our, yeah. our weekly in, our weekly insanity right after the Vikings games win <laughs> win lose or tie because there's a lot of insanity that goes on. So thank you to everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, our Twitter handle is at Report Ted. Mine is uh, at Purple Buckeye. You can find us on Facebook, Vikings Report, Drew and Ted. Uh, we're not doing Instagram. We're not doing Snapchat. Those are the only social media things we have. So thank you so much. Drew, take us. I think we covered quite a bit tonight, Ted, and I think you wrapped it up very nicely right there at the end. Thanks so much for everybody for tuning into our show. We really appreciate it. We love getting the comments below. We've got to know, get to know quite a few of you really knowledgeable people that are tuning into the show and get into some great discussions. So keep the questions coming in. Keep voting in our fantasy game. We have two prizes now. If you want to keep your uh, votes rolling along as we ran the standing today, you see how many people are in it. But you also see you can still catch up really easily if we started now. So start now. Thanks so much for all that you do. Thanks, Tunces. Thanks to the Adams family. We roll out. We roll into a bye week. We're not going to lose this week, so everybody can party this weekend with a winning attitude. We'll try to do better the next time. Say good night, Ted. Good night, Ted. Da 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 da